Marvel's Kevin Feige, I had an idea, one I cannot stop thinking about, and it's kind of your fault. You see Kevin on She-Hulk, a cool show that I liked. You introduced a character named Craig Hollis, who is also known as Mr. Immortal. He's some sort of unkillable superhuman something. In the comics, he's a mutant, but since when he first appeared on the show, I did not hear da -na 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 -na. how am I supposed to know if he's a mutant or not? But so uh, I saw him on She-Hulk and I said, I think I read a comic with this guy a little while back, but I didn't really remember much of it. So I went back and read some of his older stories and Kevin, we need to make a Great Lake Avengers show like yesterday. As I'm sure you know, the Great Lake Avengers were a super team created in 1989 that acted as a sort of parody of the West Coast Avengers. The idea was that a superhero named Mr. Immortal decided, since the Avengers were branching out and covering every coast and they already had East and West, why not have an Avengers for the North Coast, one that protects cities like Detroit, Milwaukee, and all that. And they would name themselves after their nearest body of water, the Great Lakes. After all, the Great Lakes have the longest coastline in the contiguous US. Not that that matters, I just remembered it from school. So Mr. Immortal holds auditions, gets a few members, all mutants, funny enough. It's one of the only all mutant teams that is not associated with the X-Men, not for a lack of trying, and they all fight crime and argue together. For a while, they would show up in other books like West Coast Avengers and Thunderbolts. In 2004, right around when the Avengers were disassembled, the Great Lake Avengers got their own book called GLA Mrs. Assembled, which is where we learn a lot of their backstory. This is also when they get their only other member of note, Squirrel Girl. Then some more guest appearances, they win a poker game, Squirrel Girl beats Thanos, that's all canon. And then they get their own Great Lake Avengers series that ran for seven issues in the mid 2010s. So for a team that comic fans sort of know and love, they haven't actually done all that much. But the team itself is such a strong group of weirdos that I don't think they'll ever fully go away. Anyway, you know all that, you're Kevin Feige. But also, here's a breakdown of some of the major players in the GLA books. Don't worry, there are really only five. I'm not counting Dinosaur, since she doesn't last long and there's not much to her. Dinosaur alien lady who can only speak with one other person. And I'm not counting any of the grasshoppers, although they should definitely be part of the show. Real quick, the grasshopper suit lets its wearer jump really high, and that's it. But nearly everyone who wears the suit, and there have been quite a few, dies on their first mission. It's a great running gag, but besides that, there's really not much to Grasshopper. But the core four. First, you've got Craig Hollis, who goes by the names Mr. Immortal and Mr. I. You know him. In She-Hulk, he's an older man played by the ultimate actor who plays Skis Balls, Veep and Boba Fett's David Pasquizi. Now, this version has the same powers as Craig, but none of the depths. And that's fine, because A, this show does not really need to be in continuity, and B, She-Hulk's version has a son, so that son can be this Mr. Immortal. His backstory goes like this. He's a mutant with the power to never die, or never stay dead. This is not a bullets ping off him situation. He gets lit up, and he always comes back, gets better. In fact, he spoke with Marvel's version of the Grim Reaper, and no, not the character Grim Reaper, that's just a guy, I'm talking about someone else called the Death Urge, who told Craig that he is immortal and will never die. And he's a mutant, but he's not just homo superior, he's homo supreme. He will see the end of the universe. And if you're anything like Craig and me, that sounds awful. He is constantly forced to grapple with the fact that he will have to watch everyone he cares about die. And if that were not enough, Death Urge makes sure everyone in Craig's life dies early to get him ready for that suffering. Craig's mother died during childbirth. Death Urge tricks a young Craig into burning his house down, which kills Craig's father. His first love dies when they begin to live together, and without spoiling the comics, Craig loses quite a few other people close to him. Mr. Immortal's story is unbelievably tragic. Forget Batman, forget Spider-Man. Everyone Craig loves dies. And while it is not Craig's fault, he's usually involved in their death somehow. It's a fascinating look at what an immortal superhero would actually be forced to live through. And remember, this book is a comedy. Then you've got Flatman. He's the second in command when Immortal is temporarily dead or gone or otherwise out of commission. His name is Dr. Val Ventura, and he certainly looks like Reed Richards, aka Mr. Fantastic. That's by design. You see, Flatman's real name is Matt. Get it? Like a doormat? Because he's flat? Also, Matt, very cool name. He's a mutant with the ability to flatten his body to about half an inch thick. He's also rubbery and can stretch slightly, and that gives Matt a fair amount of superhuman durability, although nothing crazy. So one day, Matt meets with someone who suggests he could make a living as a Mr. Fantastic impersonator at parties. So Matt goes with it and even falls for this guy who becomes his manager. But when Matt decides he wants something more out of life, his manager tosses him aside and Matt's out of ideas. 
until he finds an ad for the Great Lakes Avengers. Matt comes up with the Dr. Val Ventura personality as a way to seem more valuable to the team and keeps this costume that is similar to but legally distinct from Mr. Fantastic's. Val is the straight man of the group, which is a little funny because eventually he comes out of the closet as a gay man, but I mean straight man in the fact that he is grounded, simple, and in over his head but he wants something more out of life and the Great Lake Avengers are the perfect fit. Next up, you've got Doorman. He's a little weirdo. His name is Damar Davis. He joined the team during the signups like everyone else, and he has the ability to become a door. His powers are always described as teleporting, but that feels wrong. He can stand in front of a wall, make himself into a door, and then you can walk through him and the wall. It's a handy power in specific situations. He's also the Angel of Death. Eventually, after Damar dies, he takes over for the original Grim Reaper, the Death Urge, who has mysteriously vanished. So Damar has this side hustle of collecting souls and ferrying them over to the afterlife. A vastly more important task than just helping people get back into houses they lock themselves out of. But because of this, I always read Damar as one of the stranger members of the group. Not because he is strange, but because he has a job that is so bizarre, and he also hangs out with these dorks all day. Damar has a greater understanding of the afterlife in the universe than pretty much anybody else. So how could he not be a little strange? He's generally agreeable though, nobody really has a problem with it, he's just a solid member of the team. It's also worth noting that, even though it was unclear originally, Damar eventually took off his mask and met his father, and we learned that he's a black man, which doesn't change much about the character, but it is part of his identity, even if he barely ever broadcasts it, because he almost never takes off his mask. And finally, there is Big Bertha. She is too good for these clowns, but she also needs them. Her name is Ashley Crawford, although I believe it was eventually changed to Bertha. She's a supermodel who, to the chagrin of her publicist, chooses to live and work out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Ashley has the mutant ability to alter her shape and change her mass, so originally, Ashley used it to slim herself down and create the perfect supermodel body. But the power also proved useful for superheroing, albeit in the opposite direction. Bertha can gain tons of weight and mass, and with it come superhuman strength and durability. Bertha is also the only member of the team with enough money to support a venture like the Great Lake Avengers. After all, she is the most successful model in the area. The group's base of operations is Bertha's penthouse in Milwaukee, and she also seems to fund the team generally. But even though she's got a hot temper and sometimes finds herself at odds with the rest of the team, Bertha really does love the work she does with the GLA. Bertha's agent is constantly begging her to leave Milwaukee and move to New York or Milan, but Bertha's happy where she is. Now, there was another well-known member of the GLA. In fact, they went on to have the most successful career of any GLA member. I'm talking about Leather Boy. Just kidding, that guy is real though. He accidentally showed up to the tryouts thinking it was something else. But no, I'm talking about Doreen Green, AKA Squirrel Girl. I talk about Doreen in my Marvel Special Presentations pitch video, but the basics are she joined the team later than the rest, got very popular and left. While she was on the team, she saved Christmas and fought some crime. However, her original sidekick squirrel, Monkey Joe, was killed, which was a real bummer. And I think because of that experience, Doreen was never as invested as the rest of the group. In the comics, Doreen presented the intro for each issue with a disclaimer about how the book was full of terrible stuff, highlighting specific pages with particularly upsetting behavior. And that's kind of her place here. She was an outsider who joined the team of misfit friends, fit in well enough from the start, but felt it necessary to warn us that they were a little much and was never completely comfortable with the team. So it's not surprising that she eventually left. So those are the core members of the Great Lake Avengers. And when you take out Doreen, who I think would make sense as a season two edition, look what we have. Three weird guys and one slightly less weird girl who hang out together. Does that remind you of anything? Maybe this? Or this? Or this? A small group of friends living in the city having misadventures. Great Lake Avengers would be an absolutely perfect sitcom, especially because of how much each character fills the classic sitcom archetypes. Let's focus on Seinfeld. Debatably, the single most popular television show of all time. The Seinfeld characters embody four specific archetypes. And I was able to find wonderful character descriptions for each on the site SeinfeldScripts.com, so I'm going to go over those with you. Let's start with Jerry, the leader of the Seinfeld Quartet. According to Seinfeld Scripts, Jerry is one of the most normal characters on the show. He shows reasonable behavior and is generally considered the voice of reason among the other chaotic characters. He's fairly well balanced and more or less successful in his career, love life, and friend life. So, the Jerry is normal, reasonable, the voice of reason, well-balanced. Even though originally I read this as Flatman, the Jerry of the group is immortal. 
if for nothing else besides the fact that things do tend to work out for him. He cannot face the ultimate consequence of a superhero story. He can't die. He also has different love interests and the most agreeable nature of the group generally. Then you've got Jerry's best friend George, according to Seinfeld scripts. George is an insecure, neurotic, yet lovable character that is invariably dominated by his parents. He is self-aware of his nature and has in fact blamed his parents' non-divorce in attributing to his less than ideal, crazy nature. In other words, George might be the everyday late 30s perpetual single man looking for acceptance, friendship, and love. That's what makes him so likable and comedic. So the George is insecure, neurotic, self-aware, and looking for acceptance, friendship, and love. In the GLA, this is Flatman. Val, or Matt, is a wreck, constantly trying to regain some sort of relevance. He's the member who jumps at recreating the team because every other part of his life has gone to hell. He is also the most nervous member of the GLA by a mile. Then Elaine Bennis. Normally one to be assertive, confident, and intelligent, Elaine still has those lovable Seinfeld-esque qualities that make her a long-standing favorite character. For instance, Elaine does not take baloney from anybody. She's very firm in her beliefs and she's proud of it. Elaine is edgy, superficial, and well, she's neurotic too. At the end of the day, she simply cannot help it. The Elaine is assertive, confident, intelligent, firm in her beliefs, proud, edgy, superficial, and also neurotic. It would be easy to just say this is Bertha because she is the single woman on the GLA, but that's not all. Bertha is the most confident member of the team. She knows who she is, what makes her happy, and works hard to get it. She is smarter than the rest of these goobers, and she doesn't suffer fools. Bertha is big and bold. And then finally, Cosmo Kramer, the wacky next door neighbor. The Kramer is not a bashful character. In fact, he's arguably the most straightforward, wildly dispositional character on the show. For instance, in the episode entitled The Parking Garage, he's caught urinating in a parking stall simply because, well, he has to go. He's unaware of the rules, too. In the package, he commits mail fraud knowingly, but without any sense of worry, remorse, or cause to refrain from it. Kramer, in one word, is outlandish. So the Kramer is straightforward, unaware of the rules, no sense of worry or remorse, and outlandish. And this is Doorman. He's simple lives a seemingly carefree life, and he doesn't play by the rules. He's the only team member always in costume. He's a strange guy. So the team members on the GLA map perfectly to the Seinfeld archetypes. It would then follow that you can use those same proven archetypes to create a sitcom about the Great Lake Avengers in the vein of Seinfeld or Sonny. And there are plenty of actors who could fill those roles. In fact, there's some pre-existing comedy groups that you could use to construct the GLA. Who would come with their own style of comedy that the show could be built around? So I want to look at some of those groups to see how they fit the GLA. But real quick before I forget, the show would need to be animated. There is no way Flatman or Bertha would work in live action, as well as they need to in a full show about these characters. Flatman should almost always be flat. Bertha should be able to get huge at the drop of a hat. Just animate it. Think Archer or Venture Brothers. Or what if? This kind of comedy can absolutely work in any medium, but the characters can't. I'll go even further. Those two characters, Flatman and Bertha, would be very interesting in Claymation. I don't know if Disney's itching to make one of those, but if they were, this is where you start. And yes, Disney, I know, animators are unionized and hard to come by. Well, I don't know what to tell you. Treat them better, pay them fairly. However, I'm going to be casting these teams for both animation and live action, since it would be fun to see them cross over into the real MCU every so often. So alright, let's look at these existing groups. Start with the obvious one, Sunny. The Always Sunny crew could make a great Lake Avengers show tomorrow. Glenn is Mr. Immortal, Rob is Flatman, Caitlin is Bertha, Charlie is Doorman. Except I did say Doorman was black, and while we know they love using blackface, I don't think it would fly here. So I'm going to make my one consistent sub. This Doorman could be played by Eric Andre. You want a black man who can play a weirdo? He is the best game in town. I know I did say Flatman was gay, and he is, but A. Rob has been playing that sort of role for a while, and B, I don't think Flatman is that kind of iconic character that absolutely needs to be played by a gay actor. However, this is the first part of that casting that doesn't really work. But beyond that, boy can I imagine this one. The bickering, the insecurity, the Always Sunny team does it better than anybody else in the game. Second group, The Lonely Island. I've been a huge fan of The Lonely Island since their first digital short. Saw them in concert, they're fantastic. And I think Andy Samberg would be a phenomenal Mr. Immortal. 
And while you could throw Jorma on as Flatman, I think you'd be way better off taking on one of their frequent collaborators, Bill Hader, and giving him that spot. He can be pretty cool, calm, and collected one minute, and then fly off the handle in the next. For their Bertha, you could go with Hot Rod's Isla Fisher or Pop Star's Emojin Poots, but I actually think you could get more out of Palm Springs' Christine Milotti, and their doorman would be Pop Star's Chris Red. So we have another straight flat man, but otherwise a very well put together team. Next, I want to look at The State, which, and I can't imagine this is broken through, The State was a comedy show on MTV in the mid-90s. The cast branched out and started Stella, Reno 911, did Wet Hot American Summer, Children's Hospital, some of the funniest shows ever made. Their vibe is much more zany than these other teams, even Lonely Island. I don't think Lonely Island has anything that gets as close to the absurdity of stuff like Stella. We have a real deep bench here. The easiest one for me is Bertha with Wet Hot American Summer's Elizabeth Banks. If not, Children's Hospital's Aaron Hayes could be a great pick. Your flat man could be Tom Lennon, although I could see Ken Marino in that role. Neither are gay, but it's a tough cast for that. And then the big problem, the state is about as white as sketch groups go, so they actually might not fit here super well. Next, I want to give Eric Andre a shot. Because as much as I love him as Doorman, I think he would also be a great Mr. Immortal. And his Man Seeking Woman co-star Jay Baruchel could be an excellent flat man. Then you've got Britt Lauer, also for Man Seeking Woman, as Bertha. And then this Doorman is Bad Trip co-star Lil Ray Howley. I think this group could be a lot of fun. Still not a gay flat man, but otherwise, really wild comedians could make this role really interesting. I'll be honest, I don't know much about the kids in the hall, but people suggest them, and I'm sure there's a pairing in here somewhere, but they're overwhelmingly white and male, so that might be a problem. Another group I want to look at is the comedy Bang Bang Guys, and by that I mean comedians who run in that circuit. Like Ben Schwartz could be an amazing Mr. Immortal. His energy is off the charts. And you've got James Adomian, an improviser with a ton of range, who you've probably seen as either Bernie or the My Pillow guy, who also happens to be gay, could be a fun flat man. Gillian Jacobs could be this group's Bertha, and then perhaps Baron Vaughn or Reggie Watts' doorman. And then of course you've got the I Think You Should Leave crew. Imagine Tim Robinson as Mr. Immortal, John Early as Flatman, Vanessa Bayer as Bertha, and Sam Richardson as doorman. But let's say you need to create a whole new team. Four people who are not a group already, although they may have worked together. Here are my favorite actors out of every possible actor for each role. Let's start with Immortal. I really, really, really like Andy Samberg. I find him incredibly charming, but also he's just a big ball of chaos. And that's what I want from Craig. I want someone with the confidence and charisma of Jake Peralta, but someone who is not afraid to be a goofball and act like a fool. I love everything The Lonely Island has produced. I even like That's My Boy. So I would love to see Andy take the lead in a superhero project. Then for Flatman, I wanted to narrow my search a little bit, so I looked specifically at gay men, and boy did I find one in Jonathan Groff. Just the perfect straight man who can react to all of Craig's bad ideas. And also, I mean just, the look is perfect, and obviously he's great. And then Bertha. Easy one for me, it would be like Belle if she was not already character name redacted in Black Panther. But I want to pull from a sitcom that everyone was in love with earlier this decade, Schitt's Creek's Annie Murphy. She's funny, can play a model with the outward vibe of Alexis, but with the spirit of her character from Kevin Kenneth himself. Doorman is tricky, you need someone who can just be weird. And honestly, if he'd play this part again, Lamorne Morris is perfect. He's got this great, goofy energy. He can play quiet, but also big, and obviously a ton of experience on a sitcom. And like I said in my special presentations video, Squirrel Girl is Sophia Lillis. I don't even need to explain this one. And I love that she is a good 15 years younger than the rest of these guys. It'll make her inclusion in the group even more bizarre. Do I have a pitch for a season long arc? No, because there wouldn't be any. A show like this thrives off the characters not learning anything and staying in roughly the same position throughout the entire season. The comedy comes from the different situations they're in. Maybe at the end of the season they could have a big fight with a villain, but it does not need to be a whole arc, maybe just a fun callback. And I have plenty of ideas for episodes, like fun things the different GLA members can do, trouble they can get into. I have even written an entire pilot 22 pages of a superhero sitcom revolving around four characters that could very easily be turned into a Great Lake Avengers show. And I finally learned my lesson. I am not going to put that script online, but it does exist. It's pretty funny, so, you know, call me. Same goes for you, James Gunn. This could be a reworked Terrifics show or Inferior 5 or Hero Hotline. Possibilities are endless. Speaking of endless possibilities. 
I want to talk to you about a new Nebula feature. So even if you already have Nebula, which I know you do, Kevin Feige, give me one minute here. Okay, so we've got Nebula exclusive videos. Those are labeled as Nebula Plus, little plus sign here. Well, there's something new we're trying called Nebula First. Basically, whenever I release a video on YouTube, the next video will already be finished and published on Nebula. So you can watch my next video about why I believe Namor is a better Black Adam than Black Adam right now, well before it goes on YouTube. And when that goes on YouTube, my next video will be on Nebula. So basically, you're living in the future. It's really cool. A bunch of other creators are trying it, so give it a look. It has its own spot on the homepage, and the timestamp has a lightning bolt next to it. So if you've ever been thinking about Nebula, this is a great time to join. And we have partnered with this video sponsor, Curiosity Stream, to bring you a bundle that includes Curiosity Stream's incredible documentary content. Like, for instance, if you want to make sure you get Squirrel Girl right, Kevin, there are not one, not two, but three different documentaries on Curiosity Stream right now about squirrels. There is Going Nuts, Hail from the squirrel world, which I have recommended before, Secrets of Squirrels, which I assume is how squirrels fake the moon landing, and the newest one, Nuts About Squirrels. Also, there's a documentary called Little Cats that I just saw, so I'm gonna watch that and report back next time. You can get all of this for less than $15 a year. It's like $2 a month. It's such a steal. Go to curiositystream.com slash Nando to sign up and then go to Nebula and watch my next video, be it the No More Black Adam one or whatever else is coming after that. As always, huge thanks to all my patrons, people who listen to Mostly Nitpick, and everyone who watches these videos on Nebula, stay safe, everybody.